Good evening to all those listening uh, to this uh, guided meditation from the Buddha Society of Victoria um, being uh, broadcast or live streamed from Newbury Buddhist Monastery. And this evening, this is Ajahn Nisarano. Some of you will know me, but I, if you don't know me, I am uh, an Australian monk who was born in Perth and uh, ordained in Perth with Ajahn Brahm. Uh, fully ordained about 23 years ago. This will be my 24th year this year. And uh, for almost 14 of those years, I lived in Sri Lanka. And for eight of those years, lived in a cave, which was a wonderful experience. So that's the short introduction to myself. And if you have any comments, questions or complaints, please enter them in the YouTube live chat. That's that... uh, that section on the right hand side of the uh, YouTube, uh, the YouTube information. And the format for this evening, as usual, will be there will be an introduction and there will be the guided meditation, and then it says there will be a bell and then comments, questions, uh, or complaints. So that's that comes towards the end. So we can, uh, I thought this evening, just to uh, as always, I have a theme for the. The evening and just as background the theme part of the theme comes from Ajahn Brahmali's uh, recent meditation retreat Ajahn Brahmali is one of the senior monks from Bodhinyana Buddhist Monastery and he's just given an eight-day uh, meditation retreat at the Buddhist Society of Victoria in East Melbourne and that was a wonderful uh, uh, a wonderful retreat based on the Buddha's words, the words of the Buddha, the um, the suttas. So this evening, the theme that I will follow through with is caring. And this is such an important theme for all of us. It's a positive emotion to develop. But before starting that, I thought one of the very important preparations for the mind that... Um, uh, came up during the retreat and it's so important uh, that so I thought I would just focus on this because in all our lives there's two aspects at least two, two aspects there's usually many aspects aren't there <laughs> to our lives but two basic ones and the the very one that most people are familiar is with the worldly life and this is the life of the five senses you know what we see hear smell taste and touch And uh, what we think about that world too, a lot of our thinking is based on it. And really, for most people, this is their whole life. This is where we're looking for pleasure, for happiness, satisfaction, and uh, and trying desperately to avoid the opposite, all those unpleasant sights, those unpleasant smells, tastes and touches, and unpleasant thoughts about those experiences. But the other aspect of all human beings is the spiritual life. And this is actually the heart of our lives. This is where we are nourished, actually. This is our inner life. And this is not based on the five outer senses. And this is the, uh, particularly the wholesome and positive emotions, that we, the qualities or emotions we develop within ourselves. This is where, in in actual fact, our experience of the outer world comes from. Because um, if our inner world, the spiritual life, is there is satisfaction, happiness, meaning, purpose, all those things, the outer world tends to have a much more satisfying uh, quality to it. A much more we 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 can enjoy it in a different way because we know that our real happiness is coming from inside. We don't have to desperately try to get it from what we see, hear, smell, taste and touch. So the preparation for the um, the meditation this evening, and really it's very good for us to, to use this sort of preparation for the mind, is something that really gives us the pri- priority that the inner life, is the most important aspect to nourish, to give priority to. And um, the Buddha does this through a series of what we call similes for the shortcomings of sensory experience, the experience of the five senses. And for many people, this is their whole world. (laughs) So I'll read out 
Um, and it's very good to contemplate what I'm going to suggest when we do the guided meditation is to contemplate this a little bit and then go on to the theme of caring which is one of those qualities uh, that we can develop inner qualities we can develop caring for ourselves caring for others caring for the world so this is a, a, a one of the similes the Buddha uses and uh, I think everybody will be able to relate to it I certainly can and it comes from the middle length discourses and it's a suitor to a character called P Potalia and uh, so I'll read that out Householder, suppose a man borrowed goods or suppose a person borrowed goods on loan a fancy carriage and fine jewelled earrings and proceeded and surrounded by these borrowed goods he went to the marketplace then people seeing him would say, Oh, sirs, that is a rich person. That is how the rich enjoy their wealth. Then the owners, whenever uh, they saw him, would take back their things. What do you think, householder? Would that be enough for that, per that man to become rejected, a dejected, that person to become dejected? Yes, venerable sir. Why is that? Because the owners took back their things. <laughs> So too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures have been compared to borrowed goods by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Having seen this thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, he avoids, this person avoids, the equanimity that is diversified, based on diversity and develops the equanimity that is unified based on unity where clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder so that's a i think that will give quite a people quite a bit of uh, subject to reflect on but what are the borrowed goods and uh, what, what do we think we own? What do we think belongs to us? That's the important area. The things that we've borrowed are, are the things that we think we own, that we think belong to us. And, you know, this is first and foremost, of course, is the body, isn't it? The body and uh, our possessions, our relationships. Um, and there's so many more things that we would consider to be ours. Um, we may even think our minds are ours as well, and that's a bit deeper. <laughs> so, when the in the marketplace where the owner takes the takes them back, what is the marketplace? This is life uh, uh, as we are going about it. This is the marketplace is our life, and at any time, of course, the owner can take back these borrowed goods, the our bodies. Uh, uh, can pass away or our possessions we can lose them during this life and of course at death we will lose them and our relationships too um, we we'll, can break up during our life we can have partings and certainly when we die then we have we will be parted from those relationships and who is the owner that takes the goods back it's not the banks, <laughs> though in some cases the material possessions that could be the case, but it's nature, it's nature and um, that takes it back. It's the owner of this body, it's the owner of these p possessions, um, all those things that we feel belong to us and, you know, things like power, status, all those things. And these are things we cannot take with us, none of those material things. I like um, what the Quakers used to, uh, uh, I used to be involved with the Quakers and they would talk, they're a Christian group that uh, very, they're called the Buddhists of the West actually, I've heard that, all called them that, but um, they say we are stewards of the world, that we don't own the things of the world, but we need to look after them, take care of them for ourselves and for our children. And the purpose of this simile is so that we take care of what uh, we've borrowed. We're aware <laughs> that we've borrowed it. And also that 
when we realize very at a deep level we're not really the owners of these things it changes our relationship to them we don't uh, it's like uh, if we were renting a place yeah we'd look after it but we probably wouldn't invest so much time and money in it to transform it or do anything to it in a major way so likewise if we realize that these things are borrowed we hold them lightly we don't hold we don't hold fast to them so what can we take with us you know what is really um, what can we take with us to after this life uh, and that's the mind of course and all those positive qualities we've developed but also the negative ones and we take our karma as well and this is very um, important area to to give so that the quality of our life during this life is good but also the what comes after will be good as well and it shifts our priorities priorities from worldly things we all think these are number one and people say well you know in my meditation I just think about stuff <laughs> and of course what are they thinking about the things that they think are important and usually that's the things of the world they are the borrowed goods that we're thinking about and we put so much time and effort into so we're aiming, what's the Buddha's aiming to do with this simile is to change our emphasis. So we, we put more emphasis on the spiritual things, the inner life, the things we can take with us, not the outer things, and the things that lead to satisfaction, really nourish us and bring well-being. Not only that, they give us purpose and meaning, and they give rise to... Uh, a lot of positive emotions, these things we can develop, giving, you know, in virtue or morality, and through meditation and through wisdom. We can, these are really useful things to develop in this life. And so whatever we give priority to in our life, that will become uh, what we uh, think about, that's what we will value, that's what we will pursue. So if we give more emphasis to the spiritual, if we see that as actually the source for our experience of the external world, the world of the five senses, that will become something that we value and we put more importance on. And then the focus, the meditation can easily develop much, much deeper and uh, we can develop these very positive qualities. So it's what we give importance to. So I was just going to mention that simile and uh, we can, um, at the beginning of the meditation, just contemplate that for a short time. Very interestingly, I remembered <laughs> in the Vasudhi Manga, the path of purification, this is what they recommend actually for setting up the mind actually to develop this uh, turning away from the worldly, looking inside so that the meditation can really take off. But I mentioned the theme for this evening, and I'll just do this very briefly, will be about caring, about caring. Caring for ourselves, caring for others, caring for the world. And um, it's, uh, it was uh, sparked, of course, by a, um, came from a talk that I recently listened to by Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> He's always talking about caring. And he was talking about, of course, the famous Emperor's Three Questions. This is a story by uh, Leo Tol Tolstoy, the Russian writer. That's one of Ajahn Brahm's favourites, actually. He mentions it all the time. And the idea behind this story was that uh, an emperor was seeking the answers to the most important questions in life. And he distilled this into three questions. And he asked so many people, and he offered a reward, so, so many people came forward and gave their opinion, but none of them satisfied him. And uh, finally, he'd heard about a wise hermit who lived on a mountain. So he disguised himself as a peasant, climbed the mountain to where the wise hermit lived, and he wanted to ask him all the three important, the all-important three questions. However, when he arrived, the hermit was silent, and did not answer. Instead, he, uh, the, the, he was digging his garden, this hermit was digging his garden, and so 
the emperor joined in digging the garden and um, uh, helped him with that. And then later a man came and the emperor helped and this man was wounded, so he helped with his wound and when he came to the hermit's hut. And then the emperor, after this had happened, the emperor thought of his three questions. And the hermit said, you've already been answered. <laughs> he said, when you were helping do the digging and you helped with the wounded man, that what what was what is the most important time? That was the most important time. Now, now was the important time. So that was the first question the emperor had. What is the most important time now? So the hermit was saying when he was digging, and when he was helping the wounded man, that was the important time. And who is the most important person? And uh, the hermit replied. The person you are with. So it was while he was doing the digging, that was the most important thing. And then when he was helping the wounded man, that's the most important person. Ajahn Brahm often says important, most important person or thing. So, so it's the person you are with or the thing that you're experiencing. So when he was looking after that uh, uh, wounded man and also the... Um, digging the garden for the hermit. It turned out the wounded man actually was a would-be assassin <laughs> who wanted to assassinate the emperor. But uh, um, as a result of the emperor's kindness, he, he uh, repented that and asked for forgiveness. And the last question, so we've had two questions. What's the most important time? What's the most important uh, person? And the last one is, what is the most important thing to do? to care and to do good, uh, and which he'd done when he helped the hermit and the wounded man. So this is a, this is a story about developing, you know, uh, these important qualities. Now, the imp most important person is whoever you're with, whether it be with yourself, another person, or some experience that you are having. And the most important thing to do is to care and to do good. So this is the theme that I was going to develop in the guided meditation, this caring, um, because such an important way that we can uh, overcome negative states of mind by just caring for them, uh, overcoming any like thinking, uh, just by caring for them. We're not trying to get rid of them. Uh, we are um, just being there with them. This is a really important thing to do, just to care for whatever we're experiencing. And in meditation, if we can do that, then the mind has this really positive quality. We have this feeling of caring, uh, which will enrich the meditation. And it's a very useful emotion to, to develop for our daily lives. It's very much related, isn't it, to metta or loving kindness. So now, if you'd like to prepare for the meditation, and we can uh, find a posture. If you're sitting, you know, you can sit on the floor or sit on a chair, whatever you wish. Um, standing is possible, even walking. <laughs> Lying down is, of course, possible too. So there's the four postures. So find a comfortable posture. And we can close the eyes. And for the next uh, uh, 40 minutes, we can, um, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, we can uh, do this guided meditation. So we just get in contact with the present moment, just being wherever you are, making sure that the, the body is set up in a good way. The posture is reasonably uh, erect or you know straight without being too rigid, and uh, the body feels balanced. You know, the head over the shoulders if you're sitting, and then the shoulders over the hips. Just a sense of balance, and also that it's comfortable. It's not hurting. That it's quite comfortable.
And so to begin with, we can just uh, recall the simile of the borrowed goods. Is it true? So that we can turn the mind inward, away from the shiny things of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. And now we can bring to mind the intention for this evening to develop this feeling of caring, caring for ourselves, for others and for the world. And in order to do this we can bring to mind someone who is very caring or was very caring or if we can remember a situation that brought out this feeling of caring in us, whether it be caring for um, a sick animal, a friend who's having a difficult time, whatever situation that brought, brings up this feeling of caring. We can get in touch with that feeling of caring. What's it like? How does it feel? we can bring this feeling of caring and have it for the body, for our bodies. Like we're looking after a child or a baby. Caring for the body. Relaxing the top of the head, the back of the head and the sides of the head. Caring for them. And moving the attention down the forehead this warmth and caring and around the eyes 
also this warm, relaxing attention for the cheeks of the face, around the mouth. Just caring for this body, giving it this kind, friendly, warm attention. And bringing to mind the neck, all around the neck and relaxing, soothing the neck. giving it a mental massage. And bringing to mind the right shoulder, starting at the neck and slowly moving our attention along the right shoulder. Soothing it, relaxing it, caring for the right shoulder. And then bringing to mind the right arm and taking in the elbow, the wrist, the hands and fingers and slowly moving our attention down the right arm with this warm, caring, relaxing attention. Now bringing to mind the left shoulder, starting at the neck and moving along the, the left shoulder with this warm, kind, caring attention, allowing it to relax, to let go of any tightness. And bringing to mind the left arm, starting at the top of the arm and moving our attention down to the, the left arm to include the elbow, wrist, hands and fingers. This warm, caring attention.
speak, bringing to mind the back, starting below the shoulders and moving our attention slowly down the back, relaxing, soothing uh, any painful areas, any tight areas, any stiff areas, gradually moving down the back with this warm, relaxing attention. Now bringing to mind the front of the body, starting below the shoulders and moving our attention slowly down the front of the body to include the chest, diaphragm, stomach and abdomen area, giving this kind, warm attention to the front of the body and particularly any painful areas, any tight areas, any areas where there's pressure pressure, relaxing and soothing them, caring for the body. Now bringing to mind the right leg, starting at the top of the right leg and moving our attention down the right leg all around it to include the knee, the ankle, foot and toes of the right leg. Soothing them, giving this caring attention like a mental massage. And now bringing to mind the left leg, starting at the top of the left leg and moving our attention down the left leg slowly all around it to include the knee, the ankle, the foot 
and the toes, giving them this mental massage with care and kindness. Now we can become aware of the whole body and fill it with a sense of caring for it, this feeling of caring for it. Looking after it, being kind to the body. And we can bring this feeling of caring to the mind itself, whatever we are feeling in the mind. If there's tiredness, we can be kind, we can be caring to that tiredness. If we feel a bit restless, if we're expecting something, or if we've been a bit upset, just giving kindness to whatever we're experiencing in the mind, this feeling. Just being with it, we're not trying to get rid of it, just having care for it, and we're not trying to get anything, just having care for what we're experiencing. And we can become aware of the present moment and have this feeling of caring for whatever we are experiencing in the present moment, whether it's uh, pleasant or, or unpleasant or neutral, just being caring for whatever 
we experience, relating to it in this sort of wholesome way. And when the feeling of the breath comes to our attention, we can bring this caring feeling to breathing in and breathing out with this care. Caring for the breath, like a child or some uh, sick animal, whatever, caring for it as it comes in and goes out. that feeling of caring reduces, we can remember what was the original trigger for that feeling and then bring that back up and continue with the breathing in and out with this caring, this warmth, this concern. And if the mind wanders off into thinking, care for that too. Be really patient with it, not trying to get rid of it. Uh, Just being with it, caring for it. And then you'll come back quite naturally to the breath.
as we're coming close to the end of the meditation, we can share this uh, warm feeling of caring with all those who are listening to this this evening or whenever. This warmth of caring, wishing them well. Even though we don't know them, perhaps. And sharing this feeling of caring with all those that are around wherever we find ourselves, whether they be people, animals, insects, or unseen beings, sharing this feeling of caring, this warmth, this sense of connection and well-being. And we can spread it further and further in ever widening circles to encompass the whole of the earth with this warmth of caring. And now we can reflect on the meditation, our experience of the meditation. Did we find the simile, the reflecting on uh, borrowed goods, helpful for directing the mind inward, letting go of the outer world of our experience, of relationships, family, friends, work, school, or wherever we find ourselves, and coming home to our inner experience. And we can ask ourselves, uh, was I able to bring up this feeling of caring? Did this come up for me? Was I able to get in touch with it? Or, or not? And 
what caused the feeling that I experienced to arise, whether it be caring or another feeling, looking at the causes for it, the conditions that gave rise to it. And now we can develop the aspiration or the intention to let go of the world more often, to take a holiday, take a break from the world and go within to nourish the heart, to nourish the mind with these very positive emotions, these good qualities and to develop this caring deeply for ourselves, for others, and the world. So we can come out of the meditation, relax the body and open the eyes. So I hope you were able to find that or found that uh, simile of the borrowed goods useful for pointing the mind inward, that's, that's the intention of it, to our inner world. We're all very familiar with the outer world, <laughs> but the inner world is where so much of our experience of the outer world comes from. And it always reminds me of uh, Ajahn Brahm saying that his monastery was a beauty parlor. <laughs> but it's a beauty parlor for the mind. But when the mind and the heart are beautiful, the world is beautiful too. Our experience of it is very different. There are many people that are very wealthy, incredibly comfortable, but miserable. <laughs> so what, what they need to develop, what we all need to develop, is that mind that's happy wherever we are, whatever the conditions are. We don't have to have things a particular way. This is a great treasure for us, and we have this beautiful mind, which is what Ajahn Brahm's beauty parlor is all about. So I hope that, uh, and that uh, emotion of caring, I think a very useful one is related, of course, to uh, metta, loving kindness, friendliness. Um, it's something that we all are familiar with. We know about caring. We've all cared for uh, someone, for some things. So we know that emotion and to really develop these positive emotions, make them really something that is strong um, and that colors our life and enriches our life. So this is the um, developing this inner world um, and that will be reflected outwards for sure. So I don't know if there are any comments, questions or complaints. We get very few complaints, actually. Right. -o. Thank you, Ayazat. Thank you, Ajahn, for being such a caring person. <laughs> right. We do have two questions so far. Yep, two. All right. The first one is from our regular audience from Tokyo. Tokyo. Oh, yes. Right. Tokyo. Yes. 
as my attempt to prioritize was in front of me, mm-hmm. I take care of my forgetful mother. Every day, the same drama happens because she forgets, and I can be discouraged. Yeah. How should I deal with the repetitive event? Yes, that is hard, isn't it? When where something uh, situation is repetitive, as uh, it often is actually in our lives, actually to to have that caring still there for a person, you know, uh, when sometimes you know the things that we have to deal with are not that pleasant, or as you say, repetitive, and um, but of course. You know, the uh, in in that situation particularly, uh, what comes to mind is is having the compassion for the, you know, suffering of your mother, because you know d- this forgetfulness is probably something that worries her as well, and it's something um, it's that she doesn't really have any control over. So that compassion can help a lot, you know, to. Uh, to deal with situations that are very pre- uh, repetitive or chronic. We sometimes use that term for pain, but uh, chronic as well. Um, and also, you know, to uh, to learn from it. You know, this is what life is always uh, pointing at. As, uh, and the experience we have with other people, too, is to learn from them. You know, that uh, who knows, one day... You yourself may be in that situation that we forget. And I, I remember <laughs> a dear old friend, she was a Quaker friend, and she was in her 90s, and she developed this, this um, like the short-term memory went completely, actually. It was, and you'd say, she'd say something to you, and then five minutes later, or less, she'd say the same thing again, and she didn't have any recall that she'd said it. But I know, you know, that's okay for me. I go and visit, if I went and visited her, you know, that would probably be for an hour or so. But when you live with somebody who's like that, it's much, much more difficult to have this caring. But also, you know, when, when we're in those situations, also to have caring for ourselves, you know, because whatever reaction we have, often, I was going to use this in the meditation, but I didn't, it, it, you can feel it in the body somewhere. Often it's very embodied, that's what we say in English anyway. And to give that care to, to that feeling in the body can be very helpful um, to, to just allow it, to let, to let it be, let go, so that, you know, we don't get caught up in all these you know, the emotional response is like, I should care, this is my mother, <laughs> you know, and then feeling guilty that we don't care or we, we feel a bit sort of cheesed off with the situation. And so to have care for ourselves then, because that kindness will actually give us a lot more <laughs> resilience dealing with, you know, these repetitive situations. Um, and uh, so it can help us to... Uh, to be kind to ourselves as well as to, you know, our mother or to your mother in this situation. It's a, yes, it's a, it's not an easy thing with these ongoing situations in our lives that we have to, we, we if it's one-off, that's something quite, uh, we can deal with these sorts of things, you know, occasional, but when you're caring like this. The other aspect of it, of course, is just to, just to um, develop that happiness that you're actually doing something wonderful for your mother. You know, thinking about it in a, in a way that will bring joy to you, you know, like, we, and we always say this, don't we, that, you know, when we were little, our parents had enormous patience for us. I mean, you know, kids can be really, you know, quite taxing and talk about repetitive. <laughs> Um, so, you know, now the the tables are turned, as they say, you know, tables are turned and now we're having to develop this patience. Um, it's got to be this patient that's got a lot of kindness in it too, caring in it, because, you know, sometimes in English we say being patient, but it's got this sort of, um, you know, underlying irritation with it. That's not real patience, not in the Buddhist sense anyway. The Buddhist sense has always got this sense of 
meta with it too. We're bearing with something that is you know, not easy. Um, and you know, th- uh, these are things that can really teach us actually because they are, I know um, one of the biggest teachings that Ajahn Shah, he often mentioned evidently, that the biggest teaching he was giving, he said actually the two most important things was uh, that he realized in his life, Anicca, impermanence, and patient endurance. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? But that teaches us so much because we're not comfortable with things. And when we're not comfortable with things, we're alert. and We can learn from them. And also we can learn how to let go of them let go of the negative aspects of our reactions, see them for what they are, which is, you know, really unpleasant for us and suffering. So just the way you you look at your situation can help a lot. If you can bring some joy that you are serving, looking after your mother, you know, and this is payback. (laughs) But payback with, with feeling, not payback, just sort of, well, I owe it to her. So I hope that uh, helps you with, uh, you know, looking after your mother, you know. The thing t- to also reflect is, of course, like everything in the world, it's not forever. It may feel like that's the trouble with these things, you know. We feel like it's forever. It's really going to go on forever and ever, ever. But it's not the case, you know. Uh, life will end for your mother or for yourself, and um, then there'll be the parting, you know. So what we can do for each other while we're alive, even though it may seem very repetitive and and, uh, difficult to bring up positive emotions for, to keep in mind that it it isn't forever. It certainly isn't. And um, what you're doing, a real gift. Obviously your mum needs it, your mother needs it. So, you know, if you can look at it in these sorts of ways, you know, from the angle of impermanence, this gift that you're giving. And this can bring some joy to your mind and to your heart and make it easier. So I hope that uh, has answered that a little bit. Thank you very much for that from Tokyo. Thank you, Ajahn. We do have the second question. And this is from our audience living in US. Oh, US. Wow, must be. Yeah, no mm. questions for Melbourne yet, okay? Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay, the question is, how do you send kindness to feelings of anger and despair? Giving kindness is the last thing on my list when I'm overwhelmed with bad feelings. Mm. Mm. Yes, I think that, yes, when we were overwhelmed with bad feelings, I think this is... This is what I was pointing to before, and I I was going to incorporate it in the meditation, was uh, embodying these feelings, noticing where we feel this feeling, and then, you know, realizing this is really unpleasant. (laughs) This is uh, difficult for for me to bear, and then giving that kindness to uh, whatever that feeling is, because... If we give that, the the normal reaction is, you know, get out of here. I don't want to feel like this. And of course, if you, you know, if you do have that attitude, which is very common, we feel like, I don't want to feel angry, or we feel guilty about it, we feel upset with ourselves or whatever. It's just adding to the, we say, fuel to the fire. But if we can care for it, allow it to be, then it can go uh, when it's ready to go. And that's just turning that mind around, because we only have one mind. <laughs> if we can turn the mind around to this sort of caring, it will replace this anger. But if we can care for this uh, anger, this upset, this unpleasant feeling we're having, then, you know, the mind is in a different space. It's moved on to, and we feel, um, we feel more, uh, more comfortable and it can pass. Um, if we feed negative emotions with ill will, we call it ill will, uh, they will just continue actually. And we get caught up in a, a sort of like a cycle of this ever con- continuing emotion. So this caring can, this can break that 
that cycle and allow things to settle. It's really not easy to care when things are unpleasant, but it is a very good way to deal with the situation, which is not the way we want it to be, and allow that to, to pass. It will pass in its own good time, but it will pass even more quickly when we develop these positive emotions. And the thing is, by, by developing, you know, caring, for instance, loving kindness, friendliness to whatever we experience, that becomes the new habit we are developing, the new um, setting. You know, we talk about settings on a computer. It's the default setting that will be there and it will gradually replace some of these negative emotions. The reason we experience these negative emotions is we've practiced them for a long time. <laughs> over many lifetimes. So when we we can replace some of these feelings with positive feelings that uh, bring, enrich our lives, make us feel um, these positive emotions, a positive uh, a connection with what we're experiencing. So this is really the challenge to deal with our negative mind states with with kindness, with this caring. And by doing that, that become the major, the way we see the world, the way we see ourselves. Because often we're not kind to ourselves or caring to ourselves. And as a result, it means we can't really be kind and caring for others as well. And so this is, a, this is something that it's not only in the meditation practice, it, it creates a way of developing the mind that will become a habit. This is a good habit, <laughs> well worth developing. So uh, that would be my... It's not easy. It's not easy dealing with these uh, negative emotions, and especially anger. It's very strong. And, uh, you know, caring for anger when it's really churned up is difficult. At those times, it may be useful. You know, I, I see this with myself, you know, you know, you sort of say to yourself, like it's like, like it's your, you know, like you're a kid, you know, calm down, calm down. <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. Use these sort of soothing words, but to care and give that edge of caring, that positive uh, emotion with it as well. Like a parent, you know, we're really parenting ourselves, or reparenting, sometimes people call it. <laughs> so, this is some ways we can deal with it. And you know, sometimes people think, well, if I can get rid of this, then I can get on with the practice. And I say to people, this is the practice. <laughs> these difficult emotions, these things that we experience, the way we see the world, that is our practice. It's not something else. It's not something from a book. This is what we're experiencing. So this is what we need to practice with. And it's a... Sometimes not an easy practice. It's quite hard because these are the areas that uh, that our buttons get pressed. You know, you know we call, often call them triggers. With, they're triggered within us, and we react automatically, and uh, we find them so um, unpleasant. Not not, uh, and often we can feel disappointed with ourselves. You know, because we judge ourselves a lot. But these. Uh, these emotions, dealing with them with caring, with a sort of uh, patience, because that's the other thing with uh, patience, there's this sort of sense of not just for a short time, we can, patience means we can continue it for however long uh, we need to give this caring attention to whatever we're experiencing. And when you develop that, then the world will appear quite differently, people will appear differently, and also at the same time it will create this incredible attractive quality that will um, uh, attract other people to you. You know, they will feel relaxed, they'll feel comfortable, safe, and so it's something well worth developing, this caring for ourselves for others in the world. So thank you for that. I hope that helps a bit in the US. I know it's not easy, but I said the practice, this is part of the practice, yeah, for all of us. Thank you.
Thank you, Ajahn. I Thank do you. have the last question oh. on behalf of my friend in Hong Kong. All oh, right. Yes. As I grow older, I find the world is being very unfair. Mm. All the good people, they are being punished. And it's so hard for me to teach my kids about honesty, mm. integrity. Mm. Would you have any advice? Yes, yes, I think, uh, yeah, sometimes the world can be pretty tough. And, you know, you see, um, particularly, uh, I think of Hong Kong at the moment, it's it's not easy there, what's happening in Hong Kong, uh, in many places around the world, actually. But my advice still would be, you know, to um, look after those things that really nourish us from within, that give us that... Um, sense of well-being, sense of meaning and purpose in our life. If you can give your children good values um, and uh, good qualities, you know, it, when I say give them good qualities, encourage them to develop them, you know, like being generous, being kind, being truthful, all these things. These will nourish them and give them that resilience to be able to deal with whatever comes. And what's more, They'll be happy at home. Happy at home is inside each of us. People who do and say, say terrible things out there, rotten things out there, they have to live with it too. You may think, uh, you know, they uh, get scot-free, that they don't, it doesn't bother them. But I can tell you, at home is probably not a nice place to be. So our job, for us, particularly for our children, is to develop that home within and that sense of safety with ourselves. Whatever the world brings, then we've got this inner um, uh, wealth, we've got this inner security and safety, we've got this inner home. Many people don't have a home. And for people who do and say things that are pretty dreadful, they don't want to be at home. They can't be at home because if they if they reflect on what they've done and said, then that's going to cause them uh, quite a bit of suffering, actually. So often you find these sorts of people, they run on momentum of not focusing on what's going on inside themselves deliberately. They can't avoid it forever, though. It will come home. But what you can give your children by giving those good values is real resilience and a real reason to live because many people don't have a reason to live in this world. So if you can give them a sense of meaning, purpose, good qualities, wow, then they will deal with whatever comes, you know, and the world is a pretty uncertain place, unsure place, but they'll, they'll have inner resources that other people won't have, actually, that are, um, that are always focusing outside. This inner world of our minds, of our hearts. Very important to develop and encourage in our children. So I hope that's a, that helps. It's, yeah. So thank you very much for listening this evening. I hope uh, there's something, you found something of use this evening and that uh, you can, um, you found that the, uh, that simile helps turn one's mind inward so we can let go of the world and the concern, even if it is only for a short time. But at least we realize, because often people, when you say to them about the inner world, they sort of look at you and think, what do you mean? Or the mind, or the heart, people have got a bit of an idea for it. If you say the mind, they sort of look at you and think, what do you mean? Because with so much of our time is spent out there in the world that we forget that the most of the world is coming from inside ourselves from this heart, from this mind. So that's a very important reflection that the Buddha is giving us. And then also to develop those good qualities of the heart, that inner world, like caring. And then to a person that has these good qualities inside is really, truly wealthy. They can be content with themselves, at home with themselves. They don't have to get everything the way they would like in order to be happy. They're happy at home. 
So thank you very much and good night until the next time. <laughs> All right. And now we will do the, uh, the pay homage to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. For those who would like to, I almost forgot that. Thank you, Aya Santa, for reminding me. Arahang Samma Sambundo Bhagawa Bhunhang Bhagawantang Abhiwa Demi Swakato Bhagawata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supati Pando Bhagavato Sāvaka Sāngho Sāngkāng Namāmi Sādhu Sādhu Sādhu